Good morning, Vineyard. Hello, everybody out in Facebook land, too. We welcome our online community. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are here, uh, again, just to celebrate the goodness of Jesus. Amen. 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 That's still not good enough, but hey, we'll take it. Let's pray, and um, we're going to offer up some of our worship with music this morning, and then uh, worship with the word. Brenda will be sharing a message on Peter this morning. Um, so, what a great series. Have you enjoyed the call so far? What an amazing series, just to uh, absolutely. To me, it's an encouragement that there are so many different people in so many different ways. That it's truly, it's, it's that God doesn't call the equipped, He equips the called. So Father, we just thank you this morning. We ask, just come Holy Spirit, to be a part of our service today. Uh, we just welcome you to enter into our hearts, open our ears and our eyes and our minds. Be with us and let us not lead the same way we came this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So if you feel like standing, you can get to your feet. Uh, again, we just all just see what the Holy Spirit's going to be doing. You are constant in your mercy. If I fail, I say.
Oh. 
has a word for somebody this morning. That we stand on that, on that edge and we stand on that line that says, even when all else is gone, and I still trust in your love for me. And I think sometimes we say, if I can feel that, that love you have for me, Jesus, then I will trust you. Welcome to Vineyard Church. We are so. Uh, Pastor Paulson will be up today. Um, about today. The, the call of Paul found in Acts. Grab your Bible or Sal to look up the text. You'll also find it printed in today's bulletin. Food assembly boxes begin tomorrow, Monday, April 7th, 5 to 7 p.m. Volunteers are needed. On Tuesday, April 5th, we begin, um, volunteers are needed 10 a.m., more people are needed at 3 p.m., more people are needed at 6 p.m., so pretty much if you have a moment to spare, we can definitely use you, um, set up, clean up, prep, all that good stuff, so if you have time Tuesday, um, come on down. Everyone is invited to our next Vineyard Village on Thursday, April 14th, we will Participate together in <laughs> Monday, <laughs> Monday Thursday events, remembering the Last Supper of Jesus. We'll even have time for fun and fellowship together. Uh, the Vineyard Village begins at 6:30 and it ends at 8:30, so don't be late. Our women's workshop brunch is coming Saturday, April 23rd, from 10:30 to 2:30. The Quest by Beth Moore. Sign up um, out in the lobby. Uh, and then I'm supposed to invite Denise and Melinda up. Hey everyone, most of you know me. I'm Denise and that's Melinda. Right. Oh wait, I'm Melinda and that's Denise. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I thought you did that on purpose. Very funny. Uh, we, we wanted to personally thank everyone for last Saturday cleaning God's house. Um, looking up the, the Webster Dictionary of Community, it states the feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. That day, you could feel the sense of community throughout the building. It didn't matter if you were 9 or 90. Everyone was working in perfect tandem. It was super cool to see everyone have their own skill set and working hard at what excited them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even scrubbing floors like Haley in the back. <laughs> uh, we are a small church. More often than not, we pour back everything that we have back into our community so others can feel the love of God. It felt amazing that day to see many come out and clean God's house. To, to take care of what he entrusted with us. It takes a community, and we are thankful for each and every one of you. Amen, we certainly are. I just want to share quickly, Ministry House. The Ministry House basement, 85% done, and the Fellowship Hall, a little bit better than half done, going to get done in September. September? Yeah, September when we do our next one. Thank you guys so much. Just a couple pictures to show you how much we appreciate you. Yeah. 
And don't forget today's offering. We have the small table in the back. You can also um, donate on Facebook. And have a great week, everyone. Last night? Yeah, I did. Oh, my glasses are really dirty. Holy cow. I didn't notice that when I was sitting in the uh, darker areas, so. <laughs> What's that? They, oh, they rock? Thanks. Thanks. They rock even better when I can see out of them. That's an even better thing. So, well, good to have you all here with us this morning. If you're new, um, welcome. If you've been around for a while, we welcome you too. And uh, it was cool to see just the, the community working and serving together, um, cleaning up. Uh, we're going to be coming up here. We're going to be even doing um, some more stuff that we'll let you about, know about soon in terms of some repairs and renovations and things like that. So, um, so that's, that's exciting. Today we're going to be talking about Paul. Some of, the, some of you know him as Saul. He was called Saul or Paul. There's actually a Saul in the Old Testament, not to be confused with the Saul in the New Testament. Um, although in some ways they were itself, like for when I was thinking about it, I thought it just has so, many, so much baggage with it. You know, conversion, it's weird. It's got like all this baggage with it. But the bottom line is it means transformation or change or something radically running into us and, and changing our life forever. And so that's what we're talking about today because the story of the Apostle Paul is one of radical change or as one of my first points will be today, collision. It's a collision where the, where the God of Paul, the God Paul had created, collides with the real God. Suddenly, Paul is faced with this reality of a God that he had no idea about. And he had to completely go through a massive paradigm change and pa paradigm shift to come to understand who this God was. Yeah, it feels cold. Does it feel cold? Is our heat turned on? I think it is. I think I pressed the button back there, but maybe somebody turned it off thinking it was turned off, and then we turned it back on, and then... It's just very confusing with the whole heat thing. So, so anyway, so I wanted to share with you a couple stories of some people that were um, either a while ago or even more recently had conversion experiences. And um, uh, one of those that a lot of you may not know about is Bob Marley. Did you know that Bob Marley, at least towards the end of his life, came to Christ? And you know, we're always kind of skeptical about, like, oh, yeah, well, I don't know. You know, maybe he did, maybe he didn't kind of thing. But um, he still did several songs after that. There was a, an archbishop that used to be in the area that Bob Marley was. And Bob Marley um, uh, was, at that time, a Rastafarian, which Rastafarians believe that, that if you smoke pot, it kind of lowers your defenses to the world around. And um, so anyway, in this, in this process of, of Bob Marley kind of exp experimenting with some of those things, he developed a friendship with an Ethio Ethiopian Orthodox Archbishop, Abunda Yeshi Yeshik Shiak, who had been sent to Africa from the Emperor um, Hali Salis. Um, he found out afterwards that many were worshiping him as a god. They kind of saw, saw him as a god as well. So anyway, he became close friends with, with um, Bob Marley, and Barley, Bob Marley became friends with him because he, this archbishop actually stopped some of the persecution that was going on against the Rastafarians. They were being thrown in jail and beaten and stuff, and, and the, the Ethiopian priest helped stop that. And out of that, he, they began developing a respect for him for this guy. It says, years of friendship and charity earned the archbishop the right to be heard, and according to Father Mal Malalot, Bob's baptism is marked by a heroic conviction to which he lived his life. He says, I remember once, while I was conducting Mass, this is the archbishop, 
I looked at Bob, and tears were streaming down his face. He hugged his family and wept, and they all wept together for about a half an hour. And again, we think, well, did that really happen? You know, we've, we've, had, we've had stories about that. There was a, a story recently about um, Justin Bieber. And people always think of Justin, oh, it's Justin Bieber. You know, it's like, it's like, God can't do anything with Justin Bieber. He's too kind of messed up, right? Well, here's what Justin Bieber actually says. He was 19 years old when he made this really tasteless comment after he visited um, Anne Frank's house. He said, truly inspiring to be able to come here. Annie was a great girl. Hopefully she would have been a believer. And that was kind of his pre-Christian days. That was kind of when he focused on himself. It says he was 19 years old. Now he's 27 and married. And there was a GQ article in which he said, um, he's by his developing faith. He talks about the emphasis he felt. Despite all the money and fame and success, you wake up one day and your relationships are all messed up and you're unhappy. You have all the success in the world, but you're just like, well, what is this worth if I'm still feeling empty inside? He found meaning and fulfillment in forming a relationship with God. He said, he is grace, Bieber told GQ. Every time we mess up, he's picking us back up. Every single time, that's how I view it. And so it's like, I've made a mistake. I won't dwell on it. I won't sit in shame, but it actually makes me want to do better. And then he goes on and he talks a little bit more. And so I just want to share with you some of these stories of, of people that, whose lives are radically changed. Probably the best known conversion is, is the, uh, the Christmas carol, you know, with Scrooge. You guys know that story, Scrooge, you know, old grumpy guy, kind of like me. Um, my wife has, I think, literally seen every, there's been like, I don't know how many, just seems like hundreds of versions of the Christmas Carol. And they're all based on this one thing, this, this person's life is radically shifted, it's radically changed. And we have, in the book of Acts, we have the story of this guy named, the Apostle, named Paul, and Paul has one of these radical encounter story. Is this? He said, "Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, did I, did I put the rest of that in there? I didn't put the rest. Oh, there we go. The worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His immense patience." The only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And Paul says, the reason I'm sharing this is so it'll give you kind of an, an anatomy, a picture of what it means to have a changed life. What does it mean for us, for somebody to be transformed, to be, as Scripture describes it in, um, in John 3, where it talks about you know, being born again or born from above. What does, what does that look like? And so I want to share an anatomy of that today. Um, it says, meanwhile, this is Acts 9. Meanwhile, Acts was, Saul was still breathe, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now, Paul had been kind of his thing. He just felt that's what he felt was his call from God. You know, some of us feel called to go and feed people. Some of us feel called to go and, and work in a hospital or maybe um, to do music. Paul felt his job was to kill Christians, so... He thought that's what his spiritual gift was to the world. And so Paul did a good job of it. And he says, meanwhile, he was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, and the way just being what they would call Christianity early on, whether men or women, he might take them in as prisoners. He neared Damascus, and on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, the Lord told him, go to the house, on Jude, house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he sees the man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So we have a vision of a vision of a vision going on here. It's kind of 
gets wild and crazy. Lord, Ananias said, I've heard many reports about this man and the harm he's done to all the, your people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And I will show you how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who has appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you might see again and be filled with He regained strength. Saul spent several days with his disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Lord, bless your word today. And may your fire and your power just in, encourage us if we, haven't, if we don't really grasp who you are, but also encourage us in our relationship with you in the fact of what you're doing in the world around us. Amen. So this is anatomy of a conversion, and it's, it's also what our mission is. It's to see lives transformed. It's the barley or Justin Bieber. And again, when that happens with people, we think, oh, really? Did anything really happen? I remember when I was in, um, after I actually came to Jesus, came back to Jesus, I went back to the church kind of that I grew up in, and I was talking to one of the people there, and they said, you, right? You don't, it's not really. I mean, when babies are born, like when they're like three, they don't go, oh, I'm glad I'm done with that phase. You know, it's like, that's all over. But it was interesting because they didn't really have this concept of this whole idea that, that something needs to happen. And so we're going to talk about the anatomy of a conversion. And none of these are the same. None of your experiences are the same. I had a pretty, you know, I've shared my story. And mine's kind of a radical shift from this to this. Paul's is a different kind of shift from being super religious. Sense. I mean, Paul didn't go around saying, hey, this old drug pain. That's a crazy thing for somebody to say. But in this process, he encounters Jesus. And so we look at the anatomy of this. And the first thing that Paul encounters is, 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 as Tim Keller says, he calls it a collision. Where Paul's view of God and Paul's view of himself are radically altered. Paul encounters... He's going down this road. And, and by the way, this gives us amazing amounts of hope for um, people who know Jesus and for people who don't know Jesus. Because this is a God. God and, and God plucks him out and makes him one of the most brilliant and great Christian orators of all history. He makes him somebody that literally is one of the main reasons we're here today. God plucks him out of this stuff. But Paul's going 180 degrees against God and suddenly he's encountered by God. He's encountered by God. And what happens to him is so radical. He, has such, he already has these ideas of what God is like. Well, this is what God is like. God hates Christians. God doesn't die. When the Messiah comes, he's not going to die and then be raised up. That's not... That's not the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come and he's going to overthrow Rome and then he's going to set up Israel as this thing and he's going to set up the law and everybody's going to follow the law and da 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 and we're going to have this great kingdom like David had. And so he has this whole idea of what God is like. And suddenly, here there's this man who spent his whole life studying who God was. I've shared with you um, many times before my encounter with that when I was kind of searching and I was just going, I had had some pretty radical vision in roses and says here come and believe in me and you know with me it was like i'm going to show you your grave because you're headed there if you don't get your crap together and i was like oh okay <laughs> so paul's paul's on this journey and he's he's journeying to to literally kill christians that's his mission he's like that's my mission and he encounters god Second floor of this apartment I shared with my sponsor. And I, I just looked up and said, who are you? And I looked up and I'm like, I'm like, 
oh, this is weird. You know, at the time I just thought, wow, that's a, what a coincidence. I, you, know, you know, I just said, hey, who are you? And then I go down and there's this thing here. And it's like, I didn't know at the time that God was literally bombarding me. You know what's happening with Paul in this collision? He's, he's that, that, many years ago we helped, we brought Bethany out to um, uh, Glacier National Park. We drove her out there. And then we took the train back, which was really fun. Although it was kind of a mess up mix up at the beginning. Coming with us and we're all crying like, oh, what are we going to do? And anyway, that's a whole different story. But one of the things that the, the guys, on the, these rangers came and told us about the trains and they told us that when they're going through that neck of the woods, they can't honk the horns because if they honk the horns, the bull moose in that area will think that they're in their territory and they will literally go, you know, this train's going 80, 90 miles an hour. The boot, it doesn't, the, the train, nothing happens to the train in that process besides it gets full of gunk. Was that Paul ran into a freight train that was God. And he was undone. He was undone. So undone that he couldn't see. And then he didn't eat for three days and three nights. Can you imagine? You've spent your whole life studying who this God is. You, you have this belief system. Your family's had it. It's been in the family for generations. And suddenly you encounter this God, this Jesus, who these Christians over here have, have been saying was raised from the dead. And they're saying he's the Messiah. And Paul's thinking, that's heresy, and I've got to go stop this heresy. And suddenly he encounters the real God. Not the God of his own making. Not the God of his own imagination. You know how sometimes we create God in our image? We're like, well, God should be like this. And then God lets this happen. And we go, well, God can't do that. And God's going, really? I can't, huh? I remember for myself when, when, when that happened, when I had this encounter with God, and I just literally... And, and my everything in my life was, was at that time pretty far in a kind of a crazy place with what I believed about sexuality, what I believed about everything. And when that moment hit, when I had that collision with God in my life, basically what I said was, God, you are, right. you are God, I am not. And you know what's right, and whatever you say in here is my life. That now is my life. And that was, a, for me, that was a radical shift, a radical paradigm shift for me being my own God. And for Paul, it was this huge radical shift from him being and having these ideas about who God was, but then also ideas about who himself was, because who did Paul think he was before he came to know Jesus? He thought, I'm with the Lord. Went to the high priest and asked him, for letters to the synagogue. And he goes on and he's, he's breathing out murderous threats. Why is he doing that? I think it's because when God begins pressing in our lives, we get more hostile. Somebody once, I was talking about a family member of mine that wasn't walking with God and was actually being really antagonistic towards it. And one of my, one of my friends, Bill Kirtland, said, you know, when you throw a stick in a, or a rock, I can't remember what it was, in a pack of dogs, and one, this, one that yelps is the one that got hit. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You know, he's from Tennessee or something. You know, but he's, he's super wise, but he, he has, has like these funny Tennessee things. He's like, yeah, you know, when you throw a, pack, a stick in a pack of dogs, the one that yelps means that God's working in their life. If they're getting really, you know, I, I don't know about you, but be, right before I became a Christian, I became very hostile towards people who believed in Jesus. And it wasn't because they were being jerks. It was because God was prodding me. In fact, in one of these um, accounts in Acts 26, there's about three times that Paul tells the story of his conversion. In one of them it says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me and all that stuff? Isn't it hard to kick against the goads? And we always read it and we go, goads? What are goads? You know what goads are? Goads are these, the shepherds back in those days when they shepherd sh sheep, you know, sheep aren't the... It's, it's not really goads were what the shepherds used when the sheep were starting to get into a place that was not safe at all. And they were sharp, pointy sticks and they would just 
prick them a little bit so they'd move back towards safety. Or if they, if they were going to feed them, they're trying to direct them to where the food is, and so they'd prick them some. And Jesus said to Paul, Paul, you're kicking against the goads. You're pushing against this. I'm trying to, I'm trying to prick you to move you this kind of like said us like us like cats like that I know there I know Brent hears my voice but he's like not paying any attention that's how cats are you know you can go and one of them mine's named moon you can go hey moon hey moon she'll just be like what, who's moon you know like I don't see any moon um so we're kind of like that with God but the fact is that um that God's in that process and once in a while with the cats they'll just when they especially when they're little we're trying to train them not to go up on on tables and furniture and stuff. So we had, I think with us and God, it's like that sometimes, that he's kind of going, doo, 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 doo. like. Second, Paul realizes that he's blind. God allows that which is real in his life to become a reality. In fact, in um, in Second Corinthians, it talks about that. 2 Corinthians 4, it says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of the sage has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus as Lord, and ourselves for, as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of glory displayed in the face of Christ. And I think Paul was speaking from experience there. I think he was saying, I had this veil over my face. And one day on a road to Damascus, I ran smack dab, and it was blinding. It was blinding. And everybody around him could see the light. In one place it says they could see the light and hear nothing. In another place, Paul, when he's describing it, he says, yeah, they could hear something but they couldn't see what was actually going on. And so there's this kind of this amazing picture that there's, it, you know, so when Paul gets all done with this and he's looking around, he goes, did you guys, and they're like, they're going, yeah, like what was that, you know? What was that? Tom Wadsworth and I, some of you know Tom Wadsworth, and I had an encounter like that once when we were in here. I was in here praying, and I had like probably the closest thing to like a literal kind of visitation. Are you having trouble? The video people. Hey, video people. Oh, is it not streaming? Well, wait a second while I get that. Anyway, we're sitting there, and I'm thinking, is this just like, like my imagination? Am I just making all this up? And Tom, I asked Tom afterwards, and he goes, what was that? And I go, I think it was God. And we're like, whoa. You know? But there has to be a that, that we don't know, that we don't see. That we need to understand that, that we too need to come to this place. And part of the second part of an anatomy is a realization that we're blind. That we don't see. That God desires to, to open our eyes. And so Paul Paul encounters this and said, the God who said, let light shine out of Christ. And Paul had to go through this process where he, he, he kind of went from thinking, you know, I am really okay, I'm good, to realizing I am not okay. In fact, it, like I showed at the very beginning, he says, I, I'm giving you this as an example because I, the worst of sinners, was shown the mercy of God. third part of an anatomy of a, somebody coming to Jesus is, is that somebody needs to take a risk and come alongside. And there's this man named Ananias. And at the same time, Paul is having a vision and praying, telling Paul, God's telling Paul that this Ananias is going to come and um, pray for him and his scales are going to fall off and he's going to be filled with the Spirit. At the same time, he's telling Ananias, and some of you go, well, wait a second. How can God talk to Paul and Ananias at the same time. It's an impossible, right? You know, I'm just kidding. Um, 
So anyway, all this is going on simultaneously. Do you ever have times like that where God's just, you're just going, where, where you can sit, see literally the hand of God? Something that's really helpful to do, I think, is to, and we're trying to learn how to do this as a staff, is to learn to listen to God, is, is to um, take time and, and think about your day. And as you think about today, think about places that you saw God. Think about places that you saw the love of God. Be aware of what God is doing and where God's bringing you. And so this man named Ananias takes a risk. Can you imagine? Paul had, before this, had um, been killing Christians. And God calls this Ananias, and Ananias' first response is, "Here, here I am. Sound familiar? Here I am, send me. Hear him, send me. And Ananias goes. And he goes and he prays. And he says, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Isn't that cool? So he goes from being this enemy to being a friend. And sometimes God calls us to go across bridges to people and places we can't imagine. To bring his message to somebody. Maybe to somebody that we hate. Somebody that we think is way beyond redemption. What does this tell you about God's ability to bring about the redemption and the transformation of anybody? So when a Justin Bieber or Bob Marley hears a story about the conversion, you don't go, oh yeah, right. What does this tell you about God's ability to transform our lives? To transform the lives of those around us right before service started. Little Isaac came up. You know, Isaac, Jen and Paul's little guy. And he came up and he told me something. And I couldn't quite get what it was. And so Paul was kind of helping, helping me understand. And, and he said, he wants to tell you. Okay, I am never, I hope... Well, I won't say never, but I hope that I never get to that place where I just kind of go, oh, that's cute, or oh, that's nice, or what that person did to me and said, oh, you're going through that born-again phase. That born-again phase has been going on for the last 45 years. It's a really long born-again phase. <laughs> Stubborn. won't go away. <laughs> so, so anyway, it was, it was just cool. It takes companion and embrace. And Paul and Ananias takes a risk and goes and does this ministry to him. And last of all, it's about, some of you are familiar with it, it's about Chuck Colson, the guy that was the, if you're old like me, you recognize he's from the whole Watergate thing. He was considered President Nixon's hatchet man. And he did some really, really bad things. I mean, he basically was like a mafia leader kind of thing. He would order things and they would be done and 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 he got caught and he got busted. He actually took the fall for everybody else too. But even while he was sitting in that jail, literally, he he ran into a collision as he was going through this whole thing. He ran into a collision course with God. Chuck Colson says this. This guy named Tom, the president of Raytheon, or Raytheon at that point. Tom had become a Christian and seemed so different. I wanted to ask him what happened. That night he read to me from mere Christianity, particularly the chapter about the great sin that is pride. Tom told me about encountering Christ in his own life. He didn't realize it, but I was in the depths of despair over Watergate, watching the president I had helped for four years flounder in office. I'd also heard that I might become the target of the investigation as well. In short, my world was collapsing. God was pricking. That night as Tom was telling me about Jesus, I listened attentively but didn't let on to my own need. When he offered to pray, I said, oh, thanks a lot, but no. I'd see him sometime after I read this book by C.S. Lewis he gave me. But when I got in the car, I couldn't drive it out of the driveway. Ex-Marine captain, White House tough guy, I was crying too hard, calling out to God. I didn't know what to say. I went on to found Prison Fellowship, the world's largest prison ministry, and through his work in the prisons, untold thousands of prisoners and their families across the world have come to Christ. 
And that was because not only was somebody touched, but somebody listened and went out when God said. What's God, who's God calling you to go out to? Do you ever have opportunities when you just feel God says, I want you to do this? One of the things I've done all the years that I've been here, there have been different people at different times that God says, I want you to just spend time with this person. And that's what I've done. Go to a street called Straight. What street is God calling you to? And last, this redemptive possibility f- from God. Um, and and uh, the second thing is, is that, uh, that God gives us purpose, reason. He, he transforms our life. He gives us new life, but then he gives us purpose. When, he at, when, when God told Ananias to go to the house, he gave him these words. I've, re- I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your body in Jerusalem. He's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all, those, all the people. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And that isn't like a punishment. He's not saying, oh yeah, he's going to pay for all the stuff he did. That's not what he's saying there. What he's saying there is he's my chosen instrument. I have chosen him to literally kind of take all of the story of Jesus and make it comprehensible to people. And then he called him and said, he's going to be my minister to the Gentiles. But he's also going to suffer. He's going to have to, like Jesus said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. If you want to live, you die. If you, everything he wants. It takes companionship. It takes a collision. It takes us realizing that we're blind and that we need to see like somebody said ain't ain't someone more blind than those who can't see it says that there was a man named James who a few chapters before this had been preaching Jesus and Paul was there and as he's bringing this message to people there arose this immense hate towards James and his message. And he was martyred. He was stoned to death. And as it says in that passage, as, as they were stoning him to death, they laid their feet, and this is kind of where we first run into Paul, at a man named Saul. They laid their clothes. And as James is dying, he's saying, Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And you know who one of those that James was praying for right when he died? Paul. Who was later used to transform the world. Don't ever stop praying for people even when they're they're your enemy. All of us. But all of us need to have these things. We need ourselves. We need companionship to help us and 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 help the help up pray for us for the scales to fall off our eyes. And we need to hear your call and your empowering grace for us to walk a life of suffering out, to be willing to pour out our lives for others and for you. And so we do that today. And so anybody who would like to, I mean, come up for prayer, you can. If you, you know, just want to take a minute while we're closing the service up and and just say, Lord, um, I... It's a, you told you you told Paul that that you he was your chosen vessel, and I know everyone here is a chosen vessel. I pray for the shine in a specific, particular way in your world, in the life God has given you. May you shine, may you be that light, and may you hear the voice of God.